So let's look at natural gas and see what's happening there. I'm going to look at this a little bit differently than I did the oil market. Oil markets are fungible. Oil can go just about anywhere. But natural gas, is that's not true. The markets are regional in scope. Uh, most of the global natural gas trade is by pipeline, although uh, liquefied natural gas has taken its place as a major component of international trade. What this shows you, I just want to, to gear your eyes to this, is that the, uh, the blue areas show the exporting countries, while the red areas show the importing countries, and the arrows indicate the major trade movements. As you can see from the numbers inside, which sort of represent the uh, amount traded or imported in, um, in the case of red or export in the case of blue, that the big importing areas were, um, were Europe, uh, U.S., and um, North Asia, mainly Japan, Taiwan, and, and um, Korea. Uh, India uh, is a very small importer. China was not an importer. And uh, so, you know, the world was fairly simple back then. In fact, actually, what most people thought if we went back in time to about 2005 was that uh, the U.S. would become a uh, major importer. And, and in fact, uh, from an import base of around 2 million tons per annum in 2000, it was going to jump by this time to about... Uh, 60, 70 million tons a year and, and keep going. This forecast I sourced from the Energy Information Administration, but they weren't alone. ExxonMobil also had a very bullish forecast for LNG imports. Uh, since that time, the EIA has rapidly um, uh, decreased its uh, forecast, uh, dropping it by nearly 80 million tons, which represents um, most of the uh, LNG that's consumed in uh, Japan, Korea, and uh, Taiwan alone. So uh, now the forecast is roughly about uh, 2 to 10 million tons per annum. Part of the reason was, was uh, originally the uh, U.S. got most of its gas from what we called uh, conventional pools, that is, gas that was uh, produced in association with oil, which is sort of that uh, light brown, and the maroon was the non-associated or dry gas that's produced uh, conventionally. Since 1990, though, there's been a surge in what we refer to as unconventional gas production. Uh, at first, it came from coal beds, where, where uh, instead of just draining and, and venting coal gas in order to make um, mines uh, mineable, coal mines uh, mineable, the industry went a little bit deeper than the coal miners would and started producing the, the methane directly and, and putting it into the uh, pipeline system. Then they moved on to tight gas, where the formation is so tight that um, you need to actually stimulate it by either breaking the rock or adding chemicals, trying to get the gas out of these formations. Now you've probably heard a term, it's called shale gas, which means you're actually going into the, to the hard rock itself and breaking it open in order to produce natural gas. And it's this increase in the unconventional gas shown by the uh, light blue that made the difference and made the forecasters miss, miss target back in 2005. The res result of all this is that U.S. net imports have actually declined. And the forecast is for this to continue. That is, shale gas will continue to be produced in greater amounts to where the U.S. becomes a much smaller importer. Now, in fact, it's looking like we have so much gas in, in the United States that the United States actually might be a net gas exporter, which would be, uh, which would be very unusual and has caused a lot of uh, debate within the United States. One LNG export project has been approved by the um, U.S. regulator, the FERC, and that's Sabine Pass. But a number of other projects have been proposed. In total, the U.S. has proposed filings of 22 uh, BCF a day of gas. Canada is not that far behind. They have uh, filings of 2.6 BCF a day. And all of this could make the U.S. a net exporter by, by 2020. 
But the U.S. is not alone in this shale gas phenomena. Companies like ourselves are trying to actually educate uh, resource owners in other parts of the world on how they can go about uh, finding and exploiting this resource. I've listed here in uh, sort of large green blobs the uh, technically recoverable shale gas resources in, in trillion cubic feet. The total that, that has been estimated by the EIA for the world is something on the order of 5,800 TCF, which would be you know, far beyond the resources from conventional sources. As you can see from this graph, uh, one of the biggest owners of this resource is China, but Australia and India also have parts of this resource. And we're helping um, other countries not shown in this graph, this graph like uh, Indonesia, uh, how to exploit shale gas resources in their country. Another phenomenon that's occurring in the gas business is the growth in LNG exports expected from Australia and Papua New Guinea. I've listed here all of the projects that, some of which have reached FID. The bottom three projects, the Northwest Shelf, Darwin, and Pluto, which represent about 22 million, 25 million tons per annum of uh, LNG exports, are already in existence. But as you can see, starting in around 2014 and accelerating up to 2020, this amount is, is, is set to grow uh, by four or five-fold. So uh, not all of these projects necessarily will get approved, but we think these are the ones that are economic today. And uh, barring unforeseen delays, which usually always occur, uh, Australia will end up being the largest exporter of natural gas in the world. But that's not all. <laughs> um, there's plenty of other natural gas. There's been some very large discoveries in Mozambique and East Africa. Uh, which, which promised to open up a new territory for gas exports. Central Asia has been known to have large gas exports. Uh, my company has certified um, considerably large reserves in Turkmenistan, which has allowed them to export gas to China. But it also, Uzbekistan is another large potential supplier. Eastern Russia holds plenty of gas, uh, and closer to home, Myanmar, and Southeast Asia deep water all have uh, promise for gas discoveries. Uh, finally, I, I should point out that Alaska itself has lots of natural gas in the North Slope where the oil was produced, and there's debate now going on as to whether this should be uh, developed and uh, converted to LNG for Asian markets. And then finally, Natuna de Alpha, which is an old discovery, but is uh, the largest single uh, undeveloped discovery of natural gas in Southeast Asia. So turning back to my graph, what's going to happen? Well, to give you a baseline, in 2010, we see that China and India have begun to grow their, their imports, whereas the US and Mexico have actually decreased their exports. North Asia has also increased, uh, uh, meaning Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, and uh, as well as um, Europe. But well, looking forward to 2020, what could we expect? Well, if everything that I've been talking about comes true, we actually could end up with a fairly large surplus of natural gas. As you know, as the first thing to notice is that the Americas become a net exporter. Both Canada and the U.S. would be exporting LNG. Uh, China, which is the next biggest um, net importer of, of uh, potential net importer of LNG might actually reduce imports if they were able to develop the shale gas resources on the kind of scale that uh, the U.S. has. And given, given, by the way, that they started out with a larger estimate of resources. Um, I've also shown here that the um, LNG projects, a lot of which come from coal bed methane in Queensland, could come on stream, boosting exports from that country. So I've not attempted to balance supply and demand, only show you sort of what are the dynamics going on here uh, in, in trade between countries. So what does all that mean? Well, if all of these exports occur, for the first time, we might actually see gas-to-gas -gas competition in Asia. 
And this would basically have the uh, potential for converging prices, um, basically by moving gas from the Americas, which would, could be priced as, at, say, 7 to $9 an mm BTU uh, delivered, uh, compared with $10 an mm BTU in Europe and 14 to $16 per mm BTU in Asia. Believe me, a lot of people have looked at this. Uh, um, clearly, the investment community and the oil industry are both anxious to develop their projects to take advantage of these uh, market anomalies.